Welcome everybody to the Seahorse and Pipefish Get Together at Magna 2020 Online. This year's event was sponsored by Cute Companies LLC, Paula Carlson, US Mycids, Reef Nutrition, Harkins Aquatics, Algae Barn, and of course, a big thank you to Magna and Masna for allowing us to put on the event. Our first speaker, Felicia McCauley, covers the topic seahorses. They're not that hard. Stay tuned at the end of this video to learn more about Felicia, her work, and where you can find her work. And check the comments section for links to some of her latest articles and, of course, the wonderful Women in Reefing Part 2 article that covers some of Felicia's journey. But for now, let's get to her wonderful speech and learn why seahorses aren't that hard. Welcome, Felicia. Thank you so much for talking. Thank you for having me. So what's different about seahorses than regular reef aquariums? Most of the fish that we keep in reef aquariums are swimmy fish. Seahorses are completely different. They don't swim very much. They're constantly touching things. Um, they're always, ha they hitch their tail around things. Um, you know, they'll put their whole body up against rocks. So they're really prone to um, scratches and injuries, and they're always constantly touching stuff that might have bacteria or parasites all over it. Um, and heaters, heaters is a big one. We'll, we'll go over that a little later. Another big one is foods and feeding. That's what is also different about keeping seahorses. And Tammy had a really good article on her website about this that I loved. So it's really important to make sure your frozen foods are fresh. It's not uncommon for foods to go rancid in the dealer's freezer or your local fish store's freezer. So make sure you can tell the difference between fresh mysis and mysis that should be thrown out. Throw it out every three months. You know, so don't don't stock up. Blister packs are great because uh, you know they're hermetically sealed each one. Um, but the reason for all of this is because seahorses, unlike other fish and even mammals and other animals, they lack gut associated lymphoid tissue, which is in layman's terms, like the immune system of the gut. And that's what protects most animals from the bacteria on their food. And this is because seahorses evolved to eat live food. They don't need protection from bacteria on their food. Like the, their live food isn't getting you know, bacteria and, and decaying in front of their eyes. So in captivity, we feed them these frozen foods for mainly because of you know, the, the cost of live foods and for convenience. And it's really not the best thing for them, but it's the best that we can kind of do in captivity uh, for a staple diet. So it's important to get familiar with the frozen mice and make sure you're getting the freshest that you can, do the best that you can. It's also important to keep the tank extra clean. Uh, seahorses are, their tanks are more akin to like a predator tank. You know, think of like lionfish and groupers who have very high protein diets. They're, you know, if, when I worked at a, a fish shop and I tested someone's water, I could usually tell what kind of fish they had based on their water test. And these uh, predator tanks always had really high nitrates uh, because of their diet. And it's the same with seahorses. But the problem with that is, the difference is, you know, where a grouper has the gut associated with some point tissue and the lionfish has that uh, resistance to uh, you know, the bacteria, the seahorse doesn't. So they kind of have a double whammy. Uh, they are more prone to getting these infections and they also have uh, the diet that causes uh, the bacteria to grow in their tank. So keep everything extra clean, clean all your surfaces, inside your pipes. A lot of people don't think about that. Um, a lot of people like to keep macroalgae in their tank and that can help reduce organics a little bit. And something else that's really important, before and after each feeding, you should siphon the food that was left over from the previous feeding and the feces. This is such a big one, do this. I know it, it seems like it seems like a task, but if you just have a little siphon and a bucket next to your tank, you can just do it real quick each time. And that will, that will be the biggest thing you can do to prevent infection. 
another difference with seahorses, dangerous tank mates. The big one here that I'm gonna really focus on are the stinging corals and anemones. Please don't keep them with seahorses. Um, a lot of people don't realize like euphelias, like the torch corals, the hammer corals, um, they're very dangerous for seahorses and you might be able to get away with it for you know a few weeks, but eventually they're gonna wrap their tail or their body around that euphelia and they're gonna get stung. And it's very painful for them and it is potentially deadly. So don't do it. Um, obviously, aggressive fish are a big no-no. A lot of people try to keep clownfish with their seahorses, and the juveniles are usually okay. But once the uh, one of them turns into a female, becomes more aggressive, it's hit or miss. You have to be prepared. You just have to be ready to take one out if you have to. Um, another weird one is bristle worms. I know that they're like a beloved part of everybody's cleanup crew, but there have been reports and it is, it's, I wouldn't say it's rare, it happens. Uh, seahorses sometimes might accidentally eat a bristle worm or on purpose eat a bristle worm and it stings the inside of their snout and it gets really swollen and it can get infected. And I've had more than a few friends who lost seahorses because of bristle worms. So I do try to keep them out of my seahorse tank if possible. I know it's almost impossible, but if you can just keep the population low, it should be okay. Uh, here's uh, an example of a beautiful seahorse and pipefish tank at an aquarium. Uh, here are some common misconceptions about seahorses. Seahorses really should not be living in 10 gallon tanks. Uh, dwarf seahorses, okay but we're not gonna talk about dwarf seahorses today. Uh, this is a photo of a seahorse that our friend George Grippo caught himself when it was very small and it lived for many years. And when it finally died, it was more than 10 inches long. Uh, another shot of George's seahorse. Um, so if there, as you can see, I mean, that's a big animal. That's not a small animal. Uh, most of the seahorses that we find for sale in shops are babies and they're, they continue to grow throughout their life. Um, so you need at minimum 30 gallons for one pair and 30 gallons for a pair, uh, you're still going to be doing a lot of cleaning. So ideally you should have a big tank if you can, um, cover up your power heads because they can get their tails stuck in the pillars. You want to have heavy filtration. And one of the other misconceptions, do people still say this about protein skimmers? Because it's, it's not true. Protein skimmers actually prevent gas bubble disease. They don't cause it. Uh, UV sterilizers are a wonderful idea. They help, you know, take off some of that bacterial load. Uh, flow, another misconception. Seahorses need slow flow. No, they don't. Um, I think that this myth came about because a lot of the seahorses that you see in shops are the little baby ones and maybe they were, you know, not the best quality and they just didn't have the strength to fight any current whatsoever. So people started saying, oh, all seahorses need very slow flow. That that's just, it's not true. You wanna make sure you don't have uh, dead spots in your tank where bacteria and neuronema can build up. So ideally you wouldn't have, you know, a jet, like a strong jet of flow. If you can break it up with like lock line, this orange stuff here is uh, colored lock line that you can get, which is really cool. Um, like spray bars, stuff like that. And if you're using Powerheads Waymakers, cover them. Um, this is really, really important. A lot of people think that this 74 degrees number that we always say, they think it's some arbitrary number that we made up. I, I don't know. And they say, oh, well, 75 degrees is probably fine. The 74 degrees is the magic number. Um, is it possible to keep a seahorse tank at 78 degrees? Sure, especially if you're keeping it extremely clean, um, especially if you're feeding mostly live foods. You can keep seahorses at a little bit higher temperatures. But for most of us, for a typical seahorse tank, you know, a common seahorse tank, we probably want to try to keep the temperature at 74 or below. And the reason for this is the uh, 
the behavior of Vibrio bacteria changes at these different temperature levels. But you can see how the prevalence of the cholera follows the heat. And um, cholera is a species of Vibrio, very similar to the species of Vibrio that infects seahorses and also some that infect corals. And they all kind of share this similar attribute where they uh, are more virulent at these specific temperatures. So a chiller is an excellent investment if you're going to be keeping seahorses. Because like uh, cholera outbreaks in humans that happen in areas of poor sanitation and during high temperature months, that describes our seahorse tanks, doesn't it? It's, you know, the poor sanitation and the high temperatures. So uh, tank raised seahorses, are these, I mean, are these still really common in the trade? I feel like they kind of are, and I wish they weren't, but um, you really should try to stick to seahorses that came from a breeder, like Alyssa, Alyssa Seahorse Savvy is a big one, seahorsesource.com, or a, I know Chad used to breed seahorses, I don't know if he still is, um, Sam used to breed seahorses. If you can get real captive bred seahorses, um, that's the way to go because tank raised seahorses usually come from overseas and while they're inexpensive at first they end up costing you money in the long run um, they're just not as high quality and if you haven't if you're not already a seahorse expert i don't recommend wild caught seahorses at all um, they're best left to people who want to get into uh, you know, importing brood stock for breeding common ailments Vibrio, that's the bacteria, that's the bad one. Um, mycobacteria is also a bad one. That's usually something you're gonna see in um, like farms where you have a lot of seahorses in a small area. Um, uranema is another bad one, that's for me, but there's a picture of a seahorse with a very bad infection, uh, and that is Vibrio. Gas bubble disease is a common one, and that's usually caused by high organics or um, pump cavitation, stuff like that. Anyway, weak SNCC, that's usually gill ciliates or a vitamin E deficiency. Vitamin E deficiencies can be battled by giving them different foods like uh, some brine shrimp, some frozen brine shrimp have added vitamin E. Okay, so if you guys wanna screenshot this or take a picture of it, this is uh, my personal medicine cabinet. I always have these medications on hand at my house right now. You should have these before your seahorse gets sick because if you have to wait two days to get them from Amazon or something, it's gonna be too late. How to set up a hospital tank. It's actually pretty simple. I use like Rubbermaid tubs instead of tanks for these. That way I don't have to have a glass tank sitting around. But it, again, if you don't have a hospital ready to go within 15 minutes, it's too late. You probably won't have time. Uh, usually these infections or uh, ailments, seahorses succumb so quickly. So have your stuff ready. And that's pretty much all I have for you guys today. Here's some pictures. Kelly sent me some seahorses a few years ago and these were the babies they had. I love these guys. Uh, that's a gorgonian. Seahorses are great with gorgonians. Some more of Kelly's grandchildren with beautiful Siri. Another one to screenshot. Books and references. I highly recommend these books. These are all good books. Thank you for listening. What an awesome introduction into the needs of seahorses and their care in an aquarium. Felicia's talk was actually a lot longer, but she cut it down for the event. A little background about Felicia. Her specialties include aquarium husbandry, seahorses, taxonomy and identification, disease treatment, and chemistry. With over 15 years of experience working in retail, wholesale, aquarium maintenance, Aquarium photography, aquaculture, and livestock purchasing have provided her a unique view of almost every area of the hobby and industry. 
Her passion for sick methods was sparked in 2006 when she joined Seahorse.org and began working with blue striped pipefish. Breeding and raising seahorses followed soon after. Since then, she has successfully raised more than a dozen species of cygnathids, along with many other unique and exotic fish. Coral Magazine, Reefs.com, and many other publications feature Felicia's work as a photojournalist. And her social media presence includes running groups like Seahorses and Pipefish and Fish Doctors, Reef, and Aquarium Health. She's constantly trying to help others with her expertise and knowledge. Felicia is currently a part of the Marine Depot family and works in customer care providing video scripts and writing fantastic articles like the recent Secrets for Success, Rules You Should Follow to Keep Your Seahorse Aquarium Thriving. Read more about Felicia in the recent article, Women in Reefing Part 2. I'll link both of these articles in the description, and we are so happy that Felicia shared her experience and knowledge at this year's Seahorse and Pipefish event. Thank you again to all speakers, sponsors, guests, and of course, MACNA itself for allowing us to hold this event. Subscribe to the Seahorse Whisperer on YouTube to be notified when the second and third speaker videos are posted, and of course, a notification for our weekly live stream, Wine Wednesday with the Whisperer, where we discuss all of these topics about seahorses, macroalgae, and saltwater tanks every week. See you next week, and I hope to see you at next year's MACNA event.